Despite reports that the government had shelved plans for a sugar tax, concerns about the nation's increasingly obese children yesterday led the Chancellor to announce the soft drinks levy. Now, this is a tax that's going to be applied to soft drinks that contain more than five grams of added sugar per 100 mils, excluding fruit juices and milk-based drinks. Now, despite its labelling as an industry levy, it is, in fact, much more similar to the excise taxes applied to alcohol, fuel and tobacco. The tax was introduced with a specific revenue target of £500 million for the second year of its implementation, which in some sense is kind of silly given that the object of su such a tax should be, in some senses, to erode the tax base. The tax has been introduced with two rates. So the OBR has taken this specific revenue target and calculated what the implied rates um, will be. So there will be a main rate charge of about 18 pence a litre for drinks between 5 and 8 grams of sugar per 100 mils, and a higher rate charge of 24 pence per litre for drinks with more than 8 grams of sugar per 100 millilitres. Now I'm going to return shortly for what this precise um, tax design means for how different types of products will be taxed. So one of the main motivations for the introduction of the policy was concern about rates of childhood obesity. Now it's true that over 90% of households in the UK get more than their recommended share of calories from added sugar. And a substantial proportion of this sugar does come from carbonated, non-carbonated soft drinks. And this is particularly true for households with children. And this suggests, as a starting point, a tax on sugary soft drinks may be reasonably well targeted at the sugar consumption of those about whom we might be particularly concerned. But there's a big caveat here. So this tax actually has a relatively narrow base. It excludes things like fruit juices, milkshakes, and other high sugar products such as chocolate and confectionery. Now, if people have a strong taste for sugar, although they may respond to the uh, increase in prices that the tax induces by switching away from sugary soft drinks, it's entirely possible and indeed quite likely that they might switch towards some of these other high sugary products. And this could not only reduce the impact of the tax on total sugar consumption, but also have other impacts on diet more generally. So the effects of this tax, both on revenue and on total sugar consumption, are going to depend on highly uncertain behavioural responses. So as I've already talked about, on the consumer side, we need to think about how people are going to switch between sugary drinks and other products, and whether they might also begin to engage in cross-border shopping and illicit trade. You never know, right? <laughs> but a key component of this tax, uh, of the effects of this tax, are how, is how the food industry is going to respond. So perhaps most obviously, although un somewhat unsurprisingly not highlighted by George Osborne in his announcement, is that in all likelihood the prices of soft drinks will in fact go up. And indeed the OBR costing assumes that the price increases will exactly equal the tax imposed. In reality, we might um, expect that in fact the increase in prices might be more or less than the tax levied. And indeed, it may also be the case that the prices of some untaxed products might change in response to um, consumer switching in the market. Now, an explicit expectation of the policy was that it might, in fact, encourage manufacturers to reformulate their food products or their soft drinks in order to reduce their sugar content. This is a possibility, but the extent to which they do this and whether or not consumers even switch away from the reformulated products um, as a result of this is highly uncertain. So this uncertainty is not to say that a tax on sugary soft drinks is a bad idea, but rather that it may in fact not have quite the effects that the government intend. So taking a little bit of a step back now and saying, OK, if we think that a tax on uh, soft drinks is a good idea, how should we design such a tax? So the goal of a corrective sugar tax should be to bring the perceived cost of sugar consumption in line with the actual costs. And so a natural starting point for such a tax would be to have a rate that was constant for each gram of sugar contained within the product. But the proposed tax is in fact levied per litre of product. And what this means is that the tax per gram of sugar is going to be lower for more sugary products. So I'm now going to show you this on a graph. So on this chart, we have along the horizontal axis the sugar content measured in grams per 100 millilitres of a soft drink. And on the vertical axis is the tax in pence per, gram, per 100 grams of sugar. So note that this is different from the tax per litre that the OBR was reporting yesterday. And this is an important point because it's actually you know, the tax per, sh per, sh um, per 100 grams of sugar that we're really interested in here. 
So for drinks that contain less than five grams of sugar per 100 milliliters, no tax is levied. But as soon as they re reach this threshold of five grams, the tax jumps up to 36 pence per 100 grams of sugar. It then falls as the uh, product sugar content increases and reaches the eight grams per 100 milliliter higher rate threshold, at which point the tax rate jumps up again and then proceeds to decline um, as the sugar content of the drink increases. Now, you may be wondering where you know, different products that you may consume are located on this schedule. So co Coca-Cola has 10.6 grams of sugar per 100 milliliters, and this means it attracts the higher 24 pence per liter rate. But this translates into a tax per 100 grams of sugar of 23 pence. If we now compare this to a much more sugary product, so for example, Sainsbury's orange energy drink, which contains almost 16 grams of sugar per 100 mils, and again, it attracts the higher rate, but it means that the tax per 100 grams of sugar is in fact only 15 pence. Now, if you really, really like sugar, you could therefore choose products in such a way as to consume <laughs> exactly the same or even more sugar, but pay less tax. So in this case, by consuming two litres of Sainsbury's orange energy drink rather than three litres of Coca-Cola. <laughs> so now, some of you may have thought that previous graph looked somewhat familiar. Now, on previous occasions, the IFS has highlighted uh, the bizarre nature of the tax applied to wine. And it's for precisely the same reason. So wine, as required by EU law, is taxed per litre of product. And what this means is that higher strength wines attract a lower per tax per unit of alcohol than weaker wines. Now, while we can blame the EU for this uh, tax schedule, it's really not fair to blame them for the uh, new soft drinks levy. So to conclude, it may very well be the case that a tax on sugary soft drinks might be a good starting point at reducing excess sugar consumption. There's evidence that households with children get more of their tax from so uh, more of their sugar from soft drinks. But it should be uh, caveated that the effects of this tax are incredibly uncertain and depend crucially on how people respond to the tax, both on the consumer and on the food industry side. And indeed, the effect of the tax on total sugar consumption might be offset if people switch to fruit juices or other high sugary products. And finally, the design of the tax proposed yesterday leaves a lot to be desired. Levying a tax per litre means that sugary drinks will attack, attract a lower tax per gram of sugar, and really, a much more sensible schedule would have been to have a constant or increasing tax per gram of sugar. <laughs>